I Want to Jump Like Dee Dee with me, Jar Sibold, is the music podcast that does music a bit differently. I'm talking to some incredible musicians, DJs, and producers about how they use an experimental mindset to fuel their own creativity, pursue new challenges, overcome fears, bounce back from mistakes. So today we're all about rock and roll. I mean, we are kind of all the time, aren't we? But this, this, is, this is real rock and roll. And my guest today started playing in, you know, kind of like wild LA rock and roll bands, the Whirly Birds, Hollywood Hillbillies at around probably sort of 20 years old. And then really kind of then got the, got the call up to, um, I hesitate to say, the world stage, um, you know, with the you know, kind of wild mama, mama of them all, the Cramps, um, to become their first ever live bass player on the Date with Elvis tour. Um, she's never really left rock and roll far behind, um, and her new band uh, since 2016, What the Fukushima, is a real powerhouse. Did I get that right? I think I did. It's Close a real enough. power. It's a real powerhouse of tight rock and roll with a, a lineup to absolutely die for. Their debut album came out in 2018, Return to Sender, and it's, uh, it, it, in my opinion, it's a real classic. It, it kind of veers between flaming and smoldering it's sort of surfy it's garagey or garagey as i'm supposed to say i guess uh americana it's a road trip feel with this really kind of like awesome sort of rhythm section and totally recognizable guitar sound and my guest vocals are just stunning in in the kind of like the power and beauty um and needless to say my fabulous organization skills meant i missed them when they hit london on their uk tour so I am delighted to welcome Fur Dixon. And Fur, welcome. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was a great uh, intro. I, it's I, great. I, I kind of get to be a little bit of a do a little bit of a kind of album review as well. It's it, it's it, it's brilliant. Although obviously, obviously, I have to kind of prepare things quite well. <laughs> I might have to quote you on on that quote. I'll, I, it should be easy to transcript. So I'll I'll send you it over, and then you can you can annihilate well, it. Thanks. Okay. How, how are you was, feeling? How are you feeling now? Because you, you, haven't, you haven't been so well. Are you, are you fully recovered now? Yeah, I had COVID for three weeks, and mm. and uh, I was exposed on uh, New Year's Eve. Yeah. And, uh, a week later, I had it. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and it kind of blew in and blew out. Yeah. But I've had it once before. Oh really? So this is the the second. Oh mm -hmm. my god. Yep, beginning it no right idea. at the top of. Uh, yeah. COVID thing, I got it. And I was really sick for like six weeks then. Oh my God. So yeah, it happens. It certainly does, yeah. Well, glad to see you fully recovered anyway and, and sort of on form. Yeah, so when I, it, what, I, heard, I just I just wanted to say, I, I kind of, after that experience, I started to feel kind of reborn. Did you? Yeah. In, like in luck, I felt lucky that uh, I didn't get, you yeah. know, the intensity, I didn't have the breathing issues. Yeah. A lot of people said, you know, that's probably because I'm a good screamer, singer. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, you know? But um, I, after this second time, I just came out of it like kind of on a pink cloud and just feeling like I dodged a bullet and yeah, so happy and grateful and <clears throat> do you think well. It, do you think it sort of changed, you know, some of, some of your outlook and to just, I don't know. I, I, I it, it did. Mm. I don't know why or if you know what the timing is, but um, yeah, it was sort of like a rebirth. Wow. Yeah, I feel pretty great. I still feel great, like weeks after. Yeah. So I don't know about, but. Wow, that's that's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. So when when we when were you last in the in the UK? Was that that must have been what two thousand and nineteen. That was 18. 18 for the... We the actually rest, arrived. I, I don't remember the exact date now, but we arrived the night that um, at Fuck Trump was yeah. arrived in Scotland. Ah, uh, yeah. And so we played... But yeah, he landed in the UK. We landed in the UK. We played two shows, and then we were in Edinburgh, and they brought the big baby balloon up there and there was a big demonstration in the middle of town and we were like in town for that it was fantastic i was going to say that would have been, that would have been sort of right up your street seeing seeing that i mean that's brilliant timing isn't it 
yeah, it was, it was just like, oh, cool. And, and I, you know, and I've written a couple of songs, you know, one song, especially called, um, are you good times really over for good? Mm. And I wrote that about those assholes. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was perfect. And now the, and now I guess the, the healing starts in the U S I guess I'm not sure the poison is uh, complete, no. but yeah, it's kind of a interesting time. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that um, things turn out with this uh, impeachment. Yeah. Yeah. Is it really next. interesting if it um, goes wrong, you know, that's, that's the next big thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oligarchy. That's yeah. the next big, thing. otherwise fascism. So, so I, I, I guess the, um, you know, the, 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 the current band and the, your, your sort of feeling, you know, revitalized and re-energized sort of post, post COVID is, I mean, that's like a sort of double whammy of, you know, getting back to the kind of rock and roll and, 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 and then sort of health wise sort of feeling really, really kind of energized in your, in your, in your body yeah. and mind as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, and this past week I signed a publishing deal. Oh, wow. My first one ever. Thanks. First one. First one ever. Um, with Red Queen. Yeah. And a subsidiary of Harry Warren music yeah. and they're here in Hollywood. And, um, Harry Warren wrote like, um, we're in the money and, um, <clears throat> at last and Chattanooga Choo Choo and like this whole string of these like huge hits. And so this is the rock and roll section mm. of, Harry, you know, who Harry Warren obviously, you know, died a long time ago. Yeah. But yeah, so I have this, and I love the idea of this company coming from these uh, classic standard hits, you know, mm. because that's sort of like where I come from. Yeah. Um, I had a, mother and father I didn't know my father that well but my mother was a child of the depression mm. so she was always singing around the house and um so I, and I knew a lot of the you know the Sinatra and all those standards that you know in the 70s 80s we we're all going like oh you know like Bleh. yeah and now I just know that they're like a part of my um soul yeah and Oh, great. And, you know, like um, Henry Mancini mm -hmm. and, you know, these composers that wrote like great movie music and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 I think the first song that I ever remember hearing on a radio, I think it was like about three and a half or four. And I, I'm pretty sure it was Charade. Mm -hmm. And I just, it like stuck. And we were moving. So the house was empty. Mm -hmm. And I just remember this little radio with that tune. And and your your mum was was into that, in, into that that sort of style or that genre of, of music. Yeah, my mom, you know, um, before she got married and during the war, she worked in the defense plant in New York mm. in Terrytown, yeah. and they built bombers and stuff. And my grandmother was a Rosie the Riveter. Yeah. And so um, they would go dance on like Friday and Saturday nights at the top of this hotel in White Plains. That's where I was born. My family always seemed to gravitate back to White Plains, New York. It's about 50 miles up the Hudson. Oh, outside yeah. The city. yeah, not very far, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And so she would go dance to big band music and she'd see all the, you know, Stan Kenton and um, all the guys I've been watching on that jazz thing lately. That's always on. Um, um, I get, yeah, you know, all the big mm. bands. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy Dorsey and Roger Miller. Roger Miller, no, not Roger Miller, but he was in there too. <laughs> That's like another song that I remember from when I was really little is yeah. uh, King of the Road. Yeah, and yeah. And I was a small child and I could not figure out what um, trailers for sailor rent meant because I didn't know it was like separate words. Mm. And so I, I was like, what does trailers for sailor rent mean? 
like stupid little kid <laughs> thing that you just remember, you know? The, those are the things that you remember, yeah. Yeah, and so in, when I was in Hollywood Hillbillies, um, we did we did some Roger Miller. Yeah. You know, like really bombastic and punk rock, and we we did Dang Me. Yeah. Um, which is about this guy that goes out and parties all the time, except mm. it's me going out and partying all the time. Yeah. Boyfriend at the time, he was the guy being left home with a month old child. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so you 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 kind of you sort of moved from from um, you you were, you were involved in sort of singing when you when you were a kid, you know, and sort of when you when you were growing up. I mean, you 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 yeah. You sort of won competitions. And, yeah, in my mother's that, church. In the church, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and. Um, you know, that church was uh, very kind of evangelical and mm. very um, restrictive, which I think like a, a, that was probably, there was a lot of restriction straight across the board. Yeah. You know, like 1980s and before or mid 80s and before there was so much repression mm. and there's so much, um, you know, people were not allowed to express themselves. And, you know, yeah. I mean, there was the hippie time period and that was one thing, but there was still this like horrible repression. Mm. And I think, you know, maybe that created a lot of bikers and, you Why know, sort people... of reaction against. Yeah, yeah. Against yeah, yeah. And so I moved to California because I was supposed to participate with this college and in my mother's church yeah and that didn't work out at all mm. they um kicked me out pretty straight away after a year and then i was kind of like floundering around in la not really having anybody to uh hang out with mm. and then i and i moved to pasadena and in pasadena there was this great um theater called perkins palace yeah and perkins palace was about three blocks from my house and I used to like walk by there and they'd have these shows going on. Oh, and there was K rock, which was a really incredible radio station. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before Richard blade took it over. Yeah. And Richard blade. And the reason I say that is because I just noticed Richard. I don't know if you know who Richard blade is. I do don't, you? I don't know. Him, no, no. He's this, he's this English guy that came into town and, and completely fed all this like, dance music right really soft like new wave and stuff like that into you know like flock of seagulls kind of stuff maybe it was going that way anyhow yeah but yeah. prior to that there was a lot of punk rock and there was a lot of actual old rockabilly and there was mm. really interesting content mm. on this radio station k-rock so i would walk to work which was a few blocks along the route of of uh, perkins palace and i would see like these broken up cars in the parking lot. And I, and I was like, and they were all cordoned off, you know, like chained off. And it was like, who's Wendy O. Williams? Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And how she was doing this like five night run at Perkins Palace and she was blowing up a car every night on wow. stage. <laughs> and, then, and then the last night she blew up like a yellow school bus. Oh, wow. And they put them in the parking lot for everybody to like see. It was like, it was such a time of, it was like, it, you know, it was like anything goes. It was like everything uh -huh. goes back then. You know, I saw the Ramones there. I saw, um, what's his name? Um, uh, uh, I just saw him last year. Uh, the guy that wrote, uh, in cars. Do -do -do. Gary Newman. Gary Newman. Yeah. And he was like, driving around on this plastic stage and he had this like little golf cart and he was like singing you know with this like dressed up golf wow. cart it was just like and I was this kid and I was like wow this is rad and you know and um there was just so there was so much going on it was like such mm. an explosion mm. that was kind of mind-blowing what did what did the, the um so, so you, you said you're in this sort of quite you know, restrictive environment, you know, sort of within the, within the church. Yeah. And you, 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 it sounds to me like you pretty much rebelled against that. 
I pretty much rejected it. Yeah. Great I, from the time that I had like any thought in my mind. Yeah. If, so it's, maybe that maybe that was like um, maybe the church helped create who I was, or maybe mm. I just was naturally oppositional. It's 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 interesting isn't it? because like because when I was a, when I was a kid, um, I'm I'm 52 now, and I, so I was like my kind of era of the eight. I remember the the 80s. That's when I was you know kind of like a teenager, and you know going through through the you know so my kind of influences were that you know in the UK there was a the, um, very like polar opposites in the political environment. There was the Cold War going on, all that kind of stuff, and but but i i kind of grew up like my parents um you know they you know i was the only child so i was pretty much not say forced but let's say strongly encouraged to go to church oh. and then i you know and, and eventually i think i was done i was maybe 14 or so and i was just like i'm, I'm not going anymore i'm not doing it and i i wouldn't say I'm, i i don't know where that came from you know, and where my kind of love of punk rock came. I'm always interested to, under, to, to to try and sort of figure out where my own stuff and where other people's, you know, kind of where d d does that kind of rejection of well, you know, um, the, influences. the church that I went to um, at some point, it's splintered into a million different parts, but what it's mm. considered today is a doomsday cult. Mm. And that's yeah. because it's all about... Um, negative reinforcement yeah. and i think you know pretty much as a way to control people mm, mm. and so when i saw um when i heard that stuff i just thought like god if there is a god it can't be that that yeah yeah i just, i rejected it right from the beginning right as from when i could remember yeah. i had to go on with it because i was pretty powerless mm. but as soon as i could get out i was 17 and i got out mm. But it did get me to California, which is, yeah. you know, I, I grew up in New York and I, I did not, I, I probably, you know, I don't have the personality to be like a New York rock and roll musician. Yeah. It's pretty rough, you know? And so I came out to California once and I was like, oh, I love this. This is, this is great. This is where, <laughs> and the first time I came out was for one of those church contests Yeah. where I, I actually won the whole yeah, thing the whole thing yeah of your scholarship to college and that was 1976 and i was way younger than everyone else but they mm. let me in it and um then i moved out with my mom in 78 mm. and so i probably would, you know said agreed to anything in order to get to move out here so you know and, and, and i remember at, at that time when at, at that sort of contest time when you come in that was when you met buck owens uh -huh. like, wasn't it right and Jana Jay, that was and his. Jana Jay as well. She was his fiddle player. Yeah. And this little woman with this big hair. Big oh my hair. god. And you know, I didn't really know who Buck Owens was, except he was on Hee Haw with yeah. um, his partner, who passed away. Yeah. Who wrote "Thank God" and "Greyhound, You're Gone." Um, <laughs> the other guy. Oh well. Anyhow, I haven't okay. thought about him. Time. And. Um, Buck Owens had this bright orange hair. I was like, wow. And so I was 14, mm. I think. And um, yeah, it was a very surreal experience. Mm. And, and he clapped after my song. Like, and they had to like tell him to shut up. He had to like <laughs> stop clapping because he was a judge. He wasn't supposed to clap, you know. But yeah, yeah. That was like, yeah, that was uh I didn't know I was gonna be such a Buck Owens fan. I mean, wow. I love Buck Owens. I love him. And then, I wish I would, you know, seen him play live while he was alive. And that was so so that that was obviously such a, you know, kind of I don't know whether like I call it a turning point, but you know, like a real kind of influence, and I, I, from there you never really looked back. I guess. I mean, that that was that was you, kind of like away. You know, it it could have been a really straight line mm. for me, and it was not the path that I chose. Mm. Um, I thought it was going to be really simple and really just straightforward, 
and I saw myself getting somewhere that I was going to be like by the age of 21 or something like that. Yeah. And there was like, there was too much, um, there, there was like a lot of trauma in there. There was a lot of uh, choices. There were a lot of choices that I made that were like not the best. Mm. And I really did the best that I could without a lot of uh, guidance. Yeah. I didn't really have a lot of parental guidance. Mm. Um, I did ha have a lot of that um, doomsday cult kind of thing. Sh I didn't buy it but it got in me, it just it really got, got And so I had a lot of darkness and, um, and I attracted that mm. because that's there, you know? You were giving it off and therefore you, you kind of attracted it. I don't think, you know, I, I, I'm pretty surprised. Like I, it was 29 years until I saw Nick Knox from the cramps. Mm. And Cleveland and one of the reasons I was going there was specifically to see him and he said to me I didn't even think you'd ever want to talk to me again and I said of course I want to talk to you again you know of course I want to see you there was some there was stuff that happened mm. he was the one that brought me in mm. and I was 24 years old and he kind of didn't advocate for he didn't support me yeah yeah and he felt lot of guilt for that mm. and so we got a chance to like sit um and like talk about it and um uh i said so what was i like because i don't I, i'm not even sure that i like no <laughs> and he said you were great you were easy you were so easy mm. and i was like, really because in my mind i was just like all over the place and and mm. and i was you know, definitely an instigator, you know, like one night, I think when we were in Nice, the promoter um, put out all the, these, these little shots of some kind of yellow alcohol. Right, yeah, yeah. For everybody um, in the band and the immediate crew so we could mm -hmm. have a tub. And like me and Lux were standing there like looking at that table and, and nobody else was around and we just kind of looked at each other like this and between the two of us we drank all the shots on the table <laughs> and the promoter came in and he was just like <laughs> <laughs> and man I was like bad off the next day <laughs> it was a series like yeah I never I did not drink prior to the show mm. during the show there'd be like maybe two beers on the stage yeah and it was so hot that there was like no way you could get drunk from two beers mm. after mm. the show but afterwards depending on the night and it was a lot of nights there'd be like a lot of partying and i'd wake up just hideously mm. hung over and and just oh, yeah. you know yeah. Like the next day and then get in a van or get, you know, get to an air run, run through Literally an airport because you're late. And... and I'm like, Oh God, I feel so sick. <laughs> and and um, you, you're in a, you know, you're on a different continent. It's a, you know, first there's, time, there's first time there's traveling, getting anywhere, the stress, the anxiety, which I guess oh, in, and, oh, and there was no, um, there was no one, sort of currency then yes of course yeah yeah to so go to a different country we'd have to trade our money in yeah. and every time my money went like down 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 oh, i'm God. like what's going on this is like this sucks <laughs> it's like Sorry. i've got this and i can't spend this and nobody oh it's like oh my god what a nightmare the nightmare sorry go ahead no i was gonna say but you, you know the 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 stress and anxiety of, of, of that, which I guess wasn't, wasn't, you know, wasn't as, as well known or understood. No. You know, you know then, you know, particularly for, you know, in, in younger people, you know, as a 24 year old doing that, you said the first I, time. I had chronic, chronic anxiety. I bet, yeah. And, and, you know, there were some, um, 
there were some current events over there, mm. which, um, you know, like right when we got to uh, West Berlin. Yeah. It was the night after we got to West Berlin and, um, you know, Reagan decided to bomb Libya. Yeah. And then there were like anti-American demonstrations. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was really just numb and shocked and yeah. alone yeah. and really, really didn't have anybody there for me. Mm. Not that you would expect that, but I really needed that as a 24 year old person. Yeah, yeah. And so it was, it was really fun and really crazy. And, you know, there'd be like in Amsterdam, there was like this one crazy punk rock guy. And, you know, he wasn't wearing a shirt. All he had was suspenders and he was a skinhead. Mm. And we played there uh, two nights and every night he was just like bleary eyed, just like, and he'd be like climbing over top of people and grabbing my leg and trying to pull me off the stage like a like a robot or a zombie or like he was oh, under you know, he was really high on something and they'd push him back and he'd climb over and they'd throw him out and he'd come back and oh sorry about that that's okay yeah there you go um it was just it was insane. Really it was insane, so yeah. Insane. And then, you know, there was these anti-American demonstrations that we were driving mm. through every night. Uh, and then we were getting on stage, yeah. being American. And, you know, like we were told um, when we went walk through airports, don't talk loudly, don't show the cover of your passport, you know, mm. Mm. you're American, not very popular right now and all that kind of stuff. And we would, you know, get on stage thinking, okay, maybe somebody came from one of these demonstrations and I don't know. There's always that sort of nagging feeling in the, in your mind or, or kind of suspicion that you, you know, it, this could be volatile. You don't yeah. know what's going to happen. I mean, I mean, Europe was a fairly volatile, you know, continent then. Yep. You know, that sort of mid eighties. I mean, we drove by uh, in Brighton, the hotel that the, they bought, they tried to bomb uh, Margaret Thatcher. Oh yeah. 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 We drove right by it. Oh, there was like God. a hole on the front of the building. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the hell? I mean, it. and then at the same point, like this whole part, you know, we did the tour, we, we, and then we went, through uh, England, the dark side of England, and then uh, the lighter side of England on the way yeah. back. And, and we saw Elvis Presley movies yeah. in like high definition, like we have never seen them in the United States before because you guys had high def TV. Yeah. <laughs> and we were like sitting there watching cars. It was a date with Elvis, the tour. Yeah, yeah, right? of course, yeah. And we're watching a different Elvis movie like every night and it was oh, just- my. It was so cool. We were like, wow. It was just, it was crazy time. Crazy time. Yeah. What did the, I mean, that, 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 you know, given the, the, you know, the time the you know, of, of that, that decade mm -hmm. and the, the kind of the, your age and the experience, the, the experience of, of that, you know, clearly, you know, very influential on you. What, what, what do you think that, kind of made you as a as a as a person what did what did that kind of really give you after i came back i wanted to really put it behind me mm. it was a little too much it was very overwhelming mm. and a lot of it a good part of it was pretty painful mm. um i really tried to divorce myself from it yeah but, you know, if you don't deal with something, if you don't like work it through, I think with help, you know, you end up stuffing it down totally. and it just gets yeah. put on a pile of a whole bunch of other stuff that's stuffed down. Absolutely. And it just, and it just kind of hangs there. Maybe it's like right here and um, you're like, I just feel like, oh, you know, like something yeah. bad is or that, you know, so I, I mean, I, 
I like donated all my fucking stage clothes mm. to, you know, this store and just yeah. wanted to get, you know, and, and now like today I, I, I mean, I kept some stuff, but it really, um, you know, the dam burst eventually. Mm. And that, well, that was really when I had my, I, I'm okay. So like a year after, um, getting back a year or two after I moved to Austin, Texas, Yeah. to get out of LA, that was a really great town. Right. When I moved there, it was before there was like this huge onslaught of like tech companies and stuff. So yeah. it was a pretty cool town still. And, um, I broke up with my husband when I was down there. I like rebounded and got pregnant mm. with somebody else. Mm. And then all of a sudden um, I needed support. I needed help. Mm. I was like this kid yeah. who lived this rock and roll lifestyle, usually ate one meal a day at like five o'clock in the evening. Yeah. Yeah. How to do anything in like proper time or I, I'm still like the time thing is still a little weird with me because I'm mm. a night owl. Yeah, yeah. But um, my mother came down from New York and picked me up from Austin. Mm. We put a U-Haul on the back, and she drove me back to New York. Yeah. And that's where my kid Remy was born, who's yeah. 30 now. And I had to be there. Mm. Like, I had to be there. You had to, yeah, yeah. Had to be there. He, did, he is as good as he is today because we were there for six years. Yeah, yeah. And so it's just been in this process of, of uncovering, mm. you know, and throwing out like false, you know, stuff that doesn't belong to me. I mean, it sounds to me, it sounds to me, you, you know, the, the, um, you know, the decision to leave the cramps, you know, extremely courageous. This, this is how it sounds to me, you know, but you know, it was. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge band, arguably at the top of the game, very courageous to, to, to leave it. And then to be sort of facing, you know, you know the, the pregnancy, you know, ex again, you know, kind of extremely courageous, you know, having been through what you've been through to then sort of face that. And, you know, and, and to, you know, to bring up, bring up your son. Yeah. Yeah, it's and face it, the face the, the 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 fears and the doubts and anxiety. I mean, that's that, that's incredibly character building. Yeah, I was pretty numb for quite a long time, mm. and um, so I I also um, just celebrated twenty five years of sobriety. Yeah, yeah. From drug and alcohol, and that's been like an incredibly long and. My cat's licking my hand. I put my hand down. <laughs> um, we welcome all guests on this. It's it's been this like process. It's it's such this long process of just trying to get clear of, you know, just all the religious dogma and, mm. you know, it's kind of like I went from one cult to another cult. Yeah. Because I mean, you can. I mean, in a way, the cramps is a cult. Yeah. So I left one cult, joined another cult. Yeah. And just sort of have been um I'm I'm not a really good follower. I'm not a uh you know, like my bullshit meter is really strong. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to be bullshitted and I don't yeah. like to bullshit people either. I try to be really I'm from New York and yeah. I think that's a work thing that you know, you just put it out there. Mm. And I've been told by some people in California that, you know, it's kind of rough to be just told things, but at least they know where they stand. Mm. Mm. Like, I just want to be, you know, honest to honest. my truth. I see it. Mm. I don't want to be mean or cruel. And I try to never do that, but I try to let people know where I'm at. Yeah. I mean, I think, and, that I, I, no, sorry for it. Go on. Go ahead. You go. I was going to say, I was going to say, I think, I think, you know, more, more so now that, that, um, that people are looking for, 
you know, in, in, in many walks of their life, and they, and they clearly don't always get it because not, not everybody is doing it, but they're looking for that, that kind of relatability in people and, and kind of authenticity in people. Now, as I say, you, 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 I don't think you always get that, but, you know, the, you know, the kind of like the honesty that I, I, and I, I don't know, I don't know if it's like sort of current political environments where the COVID has sort of done something, but there's, there's a, you feel that there's been, there's been, there's been a lot of cover-ups that are now starting to be unpicked. And I think that the, you know, the, that authenticity in people and in, in musicians as well is, is really kind of important. That's what people are looking for. I feel like, um, well, first of all, what was really surprising to me was in 2007, when I got on Facebook for the first time, mm. I had all these people that started friending me. Yeah. And they were like from the UK and Scotland and places that I had toured. Yeah, yeah. And then all these pictures started. I had no idea mm -hmm. that I had like a base. Yeah. I was shocked. <laughs> I was so surprised. Um, and, you know, I feel like some of the people initially that befriended me, mm. maybe at a certain point were disappointed because people like to, you know, think in this way of, you know, a person has an image and they want them to not break their idea of that image. Yeah, yeah. And I've really always been just kind of, I don't give a shit. Yeah. I mean, I do, don't get me wrong, I do, but the shit that I give is like for myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not really, to, I, I mean, when I went back into rock and roll and I did this album, which started in the end of 16 and it mm. was done 18 right before my tour. Yeah. Um, well, if I'm gonna do a rock and roll show, I'm gonna put on a rock and roll show. Mm. And that's why I decided, you know, that I would get like dressed up every single night yeah. and do whole thing because that is for first of all I feel it but also it's what you do it's mm. what I believe that you do coming from where I come from especially like I used to like um James Brown and you know a lot of the uh blues and soul people that was like part of my beginning yeah it wasn't so much punk rock it you know um it was a uh, uh classic country and classic like blues and r b and stuff yeah. like that and i like the show mm -hmm. you know and i think that's what people come to in certain instances and it's my gener it's it, you know it's part of my generation maybe but that's what i i like to put put out yeah as far as you know my day-to-day -day on like facebook or instagram or whatever while i i don't like to over glorify myself as yeah. being in, but I am very politically motivated. Yeah, yeah. I am very nature motivated, and I really like. I have three animals sleeping here <laughs> right now. <laughs> and there are certain things that are really important to me, but what's really important to me is people. Yeah. Somebody approaches me and messages me, I'll give them a conversation usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've made some friends that I've never even met before. Yeah. And I hope to meet them sometime. That's and they're right. like, you're like a real person. And yeah, that's right. Yeah. This is, this is an interesting one, isn't it? You know, again, on this, this, you know, kind of authenticity that you, um, that not you, but pe people kind of display or, or, or sometimes try to display on, you know, kind of social media. And there's so many kind of pressures you know, on people and the people trying to differentiate themselves and to, um, you know, kind of stand out from the crowd. And uh, I don't know, I mean, it's kind of difficult for people. I, I don't know how important it is. I mean, it, 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 you know, clearly for, for some people it is. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I kind of think I am who I am. Yeah. This, this, this is kind of me and myself may change, you know, my, you know, this, this kind of, you know, ever-changing self kind of theory. You know, I, I'm, I'm maybe not the person that I was five years ago. My values may be the same, but, you know, I may mm -hmm. change my interests or the way that I may do things, but, <laughs> you know, still me. 
Yeah. Well, mm. I was I went through a 10 year period of playing Americana mm. or folk, old time yeah. folk. And, yeah. and um, that was really valuable for mm. me. I, I really got a great history that I didn't have before. Yeah. I, I, and it's, that's very important. And it's still a part of me. And I feel like, you know, even when I chose, you know, the, the whole Hollywood hillbillies thing scheme, mm. that was my idea. That was like yeah. my, you know, and I felt that. And I do have a lot mm. of, you know, um, you know, I won't say like New York state hillbillies, but I have like my, my dad um, and his family, you know, were not, wealthy mm. and they had to go to extremes to survive in upstate yeah. New York. Yeah. And they had to shoot some squirrels for food mm. and stuff like that. So, you know, it's in there. I'm attracted to certain things because of yeah. my DNA yeah. and all that. And I'm also attracted to, you know, being honest and truthful, probably because of my dad, mm. who was, you know, Everybody said, oh, you know, you're not really nothing. My mother used to say, you're really nothing like your dad because I was really super like quiet and really inhibited and, you know, when I was younger. Mm. But I think I, you know, have some similarities with my dad who I, you know, tragically, you know, was killed in a car crash when I was three. Yeah. So I didn't know you him. Didn't know. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I really appreciate um, authenticity. Mm, for sure. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think. I think. She, I think that's. An, you know. Uh, it, I, for me, it's hugely important. You know. I think it's. I think it's one of that is like a real, real sort of differentiator. And like you said, you know, people can, you know, smell the bullshit, you know, a mile off. You know, when it's fake authenticity, you know, it's yeah, kind of pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Um, co th things like like um, um, like collaborations, you know, kind of like collaborations, you know, in, in, any, in any kind of part of your life, whether it's, you know, sort of in the, you know, in, in, in music or whatever, whatever you do, uh, a kind of great way to, to experiment and to do different things, but they can be risky. Um, but also they can they can be absolutely fabulous. How do you, how do you feel? I mean, I mean, you your 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 band, for example. But you know, how do you feel about collaborations? I um I feel like I'm a really good participant. I really believe in um, egalitarian. Mm. You know, in fact, um, you know, when I when I started playing rock and roll again, I wanted to have a rock and roll band where everyone was kind of equal. Equal. And yeah. but the band really want that so, <laughs> so it was kind of on me and I was like okay that's fine it's more for Dixon than what the Fukushima yeah but I really like what the Fukushima because it says it all you know like absolutely fucking Fukushima nuclear power plant is still spilling yeah yeah radioactive contaminants into the water today and it has been since when did that happen 2011 or something like that <clears throat> yep um so i had a partner who i played music with for nine and a half almost 10 years uh -huh. and after we started playing music together and we were singing and sharing and all that he told me that we would never be writing a tune together i was like what? He said, Nope, they're my songs. My songs are my songs. And I said, Well, what about if you put that here for and we could collaborate? Nope. That was really um, at a younger age for me, that was pretty heartbreaking. So mm. I went about looking for someone to songwrite with. Mm. And it took me about five years while I was still in that partnership. Um, and I found somebody that I've written a bunch of really good songs with yeah. and his name is Rick Taylor. And, you know, he, I bring something 
something to the table and he will um, uh, musically add really interesting grit or alternate chords and because I you know I kind of like start out with like a three chord four chord kind of a thing mm. and um and we write lyrics together I mean we hash it out we sit there and you know like one of the first tunes we we wrote together it took maybe three months of Mondays mm. and we would write two lines or three lines at a time yeah and we'd say gotta go and then we go back to the next Monday and maybe we'd write two more lines two more lines and i mean the way that the song is written that one's called la broken river mm. actually recorded it but i haven't um been able to find somebody to mix it yet mm. i'm looking for someone to i have three tunes that i need to have mixed but um he and i you know there's a certain fr from being a kid who heard a lot of music from the 50s and 60s and it really being emblazoned in my mind there was a sort of um there was a sort of of class lyrics were kind of put together in a in a really kind of beautiful way yeah that i really like mm. um with a little bit of sophistication mm. So I find that easy to do when I'm with my partner, Rick. Yeah. And we have great, we've had really good success at it. Mm. We wrote uh, Daydream Walking, which is on Return to Sender. Return to Sender, yeah. yeah. Um, some other ones I can't read. Oh, If I Was Free, which mm. is like not a normal like rock and roll song. Even yeah. Daydream Walking is not a normal rock song, but I thought, why not? You know, yeah. like whatever I want, I'm paying for it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, so, you know, what I, ha I have a toss up myself between wanting to be really loud and being really quiet, mm. being really angry and just wanted to like, and be really emotion sort of pour out and introspective. Yeah. 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 And sort of what I, have been feeling is that I kind of like need to bring like those two hands together mm. a little more. And, you know, the thing, the thing that I've always felt is a rock and roll audience isn't really going to want to hear that other stuff. That's my, yeah, opinion, you know, so it's become, it's, it's going to become whatever it's going to be mm. as far as the future is concerned and the tour stuff like that. Sounds like you 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 are kind of experimenting a little bit with the you know the the lyric writing and then the, the you know the different you know kind of emotions that go into the music and the different sounds that that sort of produces. For you, for you personally, I know what you're saying about the the crowd, what the crowd may want. But for you, sort of personally, does that kind of spark you? Does that kind of keep you alive? The the, the you know the ability to kind of play around with things and sort of change them and try new things um yeah i could you know i, I like um that i write tunes that can be um translated mm. in different ways you know um i uh appreciate more of the early electronic music that was really kind of rudimentary and like craft work and craft work. yeah you know i like yeah. that I like that old school stuff i mean there was a lot of space mm. um patty smith brings a lot of space yeah there was you a really feel you really feel those things in between the words there's just like yeah pacing is really important there was a, there was an exhibition in London that you would have, you would have loved. It was about um, you know electronic music through the through the ages, and um, a big part of it was a was a um, uh, in one of the rooms was a craftwork exhibition, and then in in another part there was some of the some of the early sort of synthesizers, you know those that they used that really kind of gave that that minimalist sort of sound, and it went right through to 
you know, kind of the um, sort of house scene and then the, you know, kind of acid house in Manchester and so forth and, and, and so on. Uh, really, really kind of interesting. I think you would have, you would have liked that. Where is that? It was in London, London in London. Um, I think it, it ran, uh, I think it ran for about sort of four or five months last year, about this time last year. <clears throat> I really liked Eno too, because Eno came in mm. and I don't, I don't think he was a musician mm. at all. He became a musician. He became a musician, yeah. And he was turning knobs. Yeah. It was before there was anything but knobs. Yeah. And then he had this sense, this sensibility for like writing songs and he mm. had a really good voice too. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I love you. I, I guess for, for um, you know, for, for, for a, lot, a lot of people and I, I've, I've sort of felt this, this myself um, and, and I've tried to kind of break out of it, but as you, as you kind of get older, the, the, your kind of default is to sort of play it safe sometimes and you know kind of keep the status quo and I think you know people with with you know who are employed you know have you know regular jobs I think particularly sort of feel that it's like okay well let's, let's not you know change things too much how, how, do, how do you how have you and, and do you continue to kind of keep your creativity well going? It- like as as far as my mind is concerned, I have trouble with like reeling it in. Brilliant. Not reeling it out. That's excellent. I mean, I really, uh, I've always had like a um, lack of time and space, and time is really fluid for me. Mm. Um, I find that when I was more burdened with a lot of pain and stuff from the past um i didn't feel the freedom that i'm starting to feel now yeah and i'm really truly starting to feel now i'm feeling kind of lighter than i ever have yeah and i think i'm probably coming into my most productive prolific stage yeah yeah and i'm just right at the beginning of it but um like right now i also have the biggest work schedule I've ever had. Yeah. So there are time constraints. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. Mm. I think um, that's one of the one of the things is time. Time is 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 difficult to manage when you have so many ideas and and kind of things to to do. Is sort of manage. How do you fit these sort of things in? You know, I've I've tried to force things to happen, and they never it never works out when I try to force it. Mm. Like. I'm glad I got that album done in 18. It, it helped a whole lot. Um, the tour was so fun. Yeah. It was also really hard. Mm. I had not been, we did 16 shows in 19 or 20 days. Wow. Yeah. That was a bit punchy. I, I was, um, <laughs> oh yeah. And we, and we played in London. Actually it was Hackney. Yes, it was the, the I, I know where it was. It was the Moth Club, Moth Club. In that, what a place that, what a great yeah. place. Yeah. We had flown the whole night. We arrived at 1.30 in the afternoon. Oh, my, really? We picked the equipment. I went into the bathroom at the Moth Club and put on my stuff and we went on stage and played. Wow. And it was, it was kind of like that. Um, And I was still in this, you know, I, I, I still had this sort of lingering depression and it was um, difficult. It was, it was not an easy tour for me, mm. but it was really worth it. But uh, besides that, I got myself in a lot of debt. Mm. It was like, ah, uh, you know, I came home with nine grand debt. From, the t- from the tour. And we made money too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. A lot of expense, you know? Yeah. So it was just the, the time. And I, okay, so I think if there was like one message that I could give to anybody on any particular day, it's just keep going and don't give up on yourself. Yeah. Because yeah. things are like rarely ideal. But if you keep aiming towards it, 
I think sooner or later you get to have you get to satisfaction and happiness. Yeah. I was thinking after that tour or the one we did after that, I was just thinking, you know what? I'm not even going to do a band thing anymore. I'm just going to do mm. a solo and or maybe not even or any of that. But the, but COVID <laughs> has given a lot of us a lot of time to think. <laughs> And to regroup, you know, I always felt like time was like getting, I was getting yanked through, you know, everything was like going way too fast. Yeah. And um, I don't feel like that anymore. And I feel like I could actually do a tour, even if we had to do it exactly the same way we did it the last time. Yeah. Because we played at these, some of these little pubs. Yeah. In these little working town cities and stuff. And it was so fucking satisfying. It was so fun. <laughs> and the people are just so real. Yeah, yeah. And that and it's I could do that again now. I mean, that way you I mean you're kind of getting a just such a strong connection with, you know, with with the people watching you. And especially the English, who are like the nicest people. Mm. I mean you know, you guys call each other like really shitty names and it's all <laughs> good fun, you know? And it, but it's so, it, but there's like a, you know, I see it. I see the conversations that go back and forth and everything, but people are basically, you know, good, decent natured. Yeah, yeah. And it's not the same as here, you know? And I also really enjoyed Scotland and yeah. we did a, a big, part of Spain and Spain was complicated for me. That was, you know, mm. there's a different vibe towards women. Yeah. And, um, but I turned them around. Where, where did you, where did you play in Spain? Can you remember? Uh, where's the poster? We you um, we played Madrid? in uh, Asturias. That was the first, oh, yeah. it was a, um, it was a motor beach we played. Yeah. Okay. That was, walking through this much mud because uh, they couldn't get the van in up to the stage yeah and then the ramp to get up to the stage it had been <laughs> raining like four days straight it does rain a lot up there at certain times of the year yeah and and the ramp was like this and it was metal oh, and it no. had no, like There's and we no were grip. like pulling ourselves up this <laughs> this is probably like, wow true this is probably diy stuff isn't it it was just but you know it was a great show that night too and there were yeah. all these people and they were like muddy and it we didn't go on to like 12 30 at night yeah yeah and there was a huge audience there do things light yeah it, um i can't remember the names of the other places yeah, i'm sorry yeah. no 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 it's okay i'll, I'll look up but you know it was the summertime it was and you know we played in portugal one night loved portugal mm. You know, I just go on, go by how people treat me, and the... does, does does that 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 kind of reaction that you get, you know, that that kind of like sort of strong feeling that you get from the from the from the audience, kind of keep your self belief going? You know, you say you come back with nine grand debt or something, and it's like, oh, <laughs> god, you know, you back with what? With with that amount of debt, you know, from a from a tour. You know, and you're thinking, oh my god, right? Where, where, do, where do we start? Do, does, does the the reaction of the memories of the crowd, you know, kind of help with the self belief to kind of keep it going and to, you know, this this is the right thing to do. Don't don't give. You know what you're saying? Don't give up. Um. Well, I didn't say I didn't give up. Mm. That idea about touring and stuff like that. I just don't give up on. You know believing that the next right thing will happen will happen got you yeah and that and that for me i've had to wait mm. like i've had to wait so long i mean just the idea i mean just to be perfect you know perfectly honest i'm going to be 59 this month mm. right mm. so i have um bosses that i work for yeah and they're like 24 years older than me mm. right mm. they're all whole different generation they're a whole different like way of getting old and how you behave when you get old yeah yeah and i'm like god they're only like 
under 25 years older than me and they're and they're the way they approach life is completely different so all i've been trying you know and and this might sound really hokey but i do come from you know that hippie thing i was a little girl and mm. my sister eight years older than me and she was a hippie so i was a hippie too you know mm. so she was like 18 and i was 10 yeah and so i, I felt like a older person but you know i keep thinking about that i wouldn't even mention this in another time but that Joni mitchell song woodstock mm. yeah and and you know it just pops into my head you know we got to get ourselves back to the garden mm -hmm. whatever that means i think it means just cutting back to the essence mm. cutting through all the bullshit and all the you know media and all the you know getting back to my essence of what really is important mm. to me and then putting it out there mm -hmm. and you know there's so much acceptance for so many different kinds of music now yeah i mean absolutely it's so, it's so different than it was 30 years ago where there was no acceptance where you couldn't get a job if you had tattoos. Yeah, yeah. That I was just like looked at and ridiculed because I had different colored hair. Yeah, yeah. You know, bullshit. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. I mean, I've I've been I've been you know sort of really influenced by um, I mean part of the you know the the business that I've set up I've been really influenced by um, the writing of, um, a professor at the London business school, Linda Gratt, and she wrote about the hundred year life, which is basically saying that, you know, our lives now, or let's say somebody who's born today can expect to live, you know, if they're born into a Western country can live till they're a hundred, they can expect mm -hmm. that. So we're living longer, we're working longer. And, you know, so your, your bosses who are that sort of generation up, my, my mum and dad, who are that sort of, you know, that, that older generation, their, their living and working life is completely different. And they do not understand. I mean, you know, my mum has dementia and my, my dad is, is, is kind of starting to, to not do so well. But, you know, even, you know, a few years ago, they, they didn't really kind of understand the... Kind of issues that I was facing as a sort of fifty-two-year-old, thinking, you know, I'm going to be living a lot longer than previous generations, and I'm going to be working longer. I can't, you know, I've got to do different things. Yeah, and I mean, I I, there is a generational thing that's that's happening. Now. I, I used to really like, ju I used to really judge people who would come would go into retirement and on the road. Mm. And I think, well, they should have been doing that all along, you know, yeah. but these people also had to live and to raise families and stuff yeah. like that so yeah. worked, right? Yeah, yeah. Ronnie Spector, I think she was cleaning a house or something and she heard her song on the radio and found out that she was coming back into, you know, she was able to go back into music after she yeah. had completely left it behind. Mm. You know, like I had, I had been working a, a shortened week in order to be able to spend time in the studio and write music and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. And about a year ago, I was offered another, I, I work with different clients every day of the week mm. and I was offered this other job. And I thought, fuck it, I might as well make some money. Mm, mm. And just do what I can because at some point I'll be able to stop doing this and just be able to do music full time and I'll have some dough. Yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And that's like uh, such a weird mindset for somebody like me who is gonna like make it by 21, you know? But I also wanted a really normal life. Yeah. I didn't want to live the life of some privileged person. I wanted a real life, mm -hmm. and um, I got it. <laughs> but, but, but I mean, the, I mean, the thing the thing is, though, you, you know, by doing that, what you've been able to do is kind of use the the skills that you've learned, you know, in whatever form in those sort of previous years, and apply them to to something else. You know, which is which has allowed you that then gives you that sort of bit of freedom to then do more with the music. 
it's kind of like this sort of putting these kind of jigsaw pieces together almost, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, time to get my head on straight so I could really yeah. enjoy. Yeah. I want to go on. I mean, it is hard going on the road. It's, yeah. it's really grueling and everything, but I really want maximum enjoyment. Yeah, yeah. Even a few years ago, I wasn't thinking about enjoying myself, mm. anything. And, you know, like I have to tell my kids, do something enjoyable today. Do yeah. something fun. Yeah, yeah. Like have some fun. Nobody ever told me to do that. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know? it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, because you, 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 you know, when you were a real kid, like a, a, a toddler, you get asked, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? you get to so so it's all about imagination and and you know what could you imagine this your your future life to be you go to school that gets kicked out of you you know it's like this is about you know kind of like ticking boxes and sort of doing things properly and all that kind of stuff and and it loses the fun yeah you know of, it can, of that, of that you know, kind it, of it it can you know it didn't do it for uh remy my kid yeah he, um they could have gone and and gotten like uh, they graduated from university, came back, couldn't find work, couldn't mm -hmm. find work, always wanted to be in the film industry, met someone who was about to graduate from film school mm -hmm. and started working on student projects yeah. and then on other projects and then started working on feature projects and now is working all the time in film. Wow. And stuff like that. And Remy feels that it's because they didn't sell out. Mm. That they said, no, nope, not fucking working at Starbucks right now to get by. Got to yeah. keep my eyes on my, and it worked. And it, luckily it worked out. That's fabulous. Yeah. So I'm in yeah, utter really of that. It, absolutely. It, absolutely. Because yeah. that was not out from where we came from from our parents mm. yeah you know yeah you're absolutely right absolutely yeah. right listen for thank you so much i could um i could thanks so much honestly i could i could talk to you for hours it's been fascinating. i don't know i don't even know if it's like uh what it was your if we discussed much of what your you were meaning we did we did. Oh, we did. We got a lot. Of, we got a lot. Of, it, it, it was there was there was a bit of the stories in there, but there was a lot of stuff about, you know, about about you, about you, the person that was that was fantastic. And I just, you know, one thing I, I really want to learn is I want to learn more technology. Yeah. I want to get a synth. And I want to learn how to incorporate it and maybe even pre program some stuff that I could play against, like in that old school kind of way. Um, okay. Don't know that yet, but that's like a plan of mine. Okay. Yeah. Just ex you know, expand a little bit more off of just guitar and and yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. I might have some ideas on that, so I'll talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Right on. Okay. Cool. Brilliant. Thanks so much for. Thank uh, it's you. It's been, been phenomenal. I really appreciate you taking the time. I have a website. It's, oh yes. Uh, yeah. Please. W yeah. W for Dixon.com. Um, I don't think I've updated it in like a year, but you can still get albums. I'm also on Bandcamp. I have like really good high quality good downloads platform. from Bandcamp for Dixon. Yeah. And uh, yeah, hit me up. I'm around. Brilliant. All right. Cheers, Fred. Take care. Yeah, take care. Stay well. Thanks for listening to the show. And I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll tune in for the next episode. In the meantime, it would be really awesome if you could rate and review the show and also share it with any friends who you think might enjoy it.